This is a this is how I do it for a transcarotid artery vascularization. I'm Chris Henry, first year vascular surgery fellow at Baylor in Dallas. Uh, presenter selection operation, ten steps. Go through the technical aspects of that operation. Anything that we think might be prudent is open for discussion. Case planning, patient positioning, instruments, retractors, any sort of small technical tips, as well as any post-op tricks, any any follow-up, all, all are available or are up for discussion. So presenter goes through the slides uninterrupted first, uh, then as a group we'll go back and really dissect each step and kind of discuss things as we see fit. And like Dr. I had stated previously, the overarching goal is for the trainee to think about how they will do the operation once they get out of, uh, out of uh, training. And then thinking about, okay, what do you want on your preference card? What do you want in your hand? What do you want in the room so that there's no, no delays and no frustrations for you long term? So preoperatively, review the imaging, CTA head and neck uh, is our typical uh, modality. Uh, ensure there's greater than five centimeters from the clavicle to the bifurcation, and then measure the ICA diameter. Preferably, we like to do this in our endovascular suite. If that's being used, then we'll do C-arm in an OR. The way we set it up for the endovascular suite is the C-arm coming in from the head and then kind of uh, backing out. So it's not coming in uh, from the side. It helps to have an experienced team, your radiology tech that knows your settings. We let them run the table. Um, the CRNA who knows we need the blood pressure up, we need patient heparinized when we start the operation. Uh, the circulator is scrubbed to have everything that we need in the room uh, so that there are no uh, unnecessary delays. Dr. Grimsley uh, is our guy that does most of our T-cars and has always placed emphasis on a perfect case because in this operation more than probably any other it's technical missteps are not tolerated this is perfect case scenario I, I like to ultrasound the groin before we prep to set the depth and the gain um, and then i <clears throat> have a separate little setup that i use with the micropuncture needle micro wire the j wire and the venous sheath I have that separate so i don't have to ask the scrub for anything and i'm just an independent operator when i'm doing the groin line and dr grimsley or whoever is starting at the neck but I like to have the ultrasound set up to my settings before anything, so I don't have to have the circulator twisting the knobs, and it's just ready to go. Prep with the arms tucked, head away from the side of the lesion, prep the groin in the neck, ensure that the radiology tech is in the room, ready to go. The operating surgeon stands on the patient's right, uh, at least for right-handed surgeons. So while I'm doing the line, we'll typically start the skin incision up top. We'll heparinize the patient when we start the operation. You make the incision one finger breadth above the clavicle over the SCM, um, bovey down through platysma. We use two springs to, to provide exposure. Identify their fade between the sternal and clavicular head SCM. A lot of times it's pretty apparent, but sometimes it can be difficult to identify that. But that's uh, go down to sec down between those two. The, make sure that you dissect downwards towards the clavicle because um, you're really trying to get down low on the carotid and if you skive upward it makes the operation more difficult especially if you have a low lesion. Uh, the regular wheat landers are inserted uh, for exposure. You find the IJ uh, and there's usually a crossing branch you ligate with a 3 silk and then a medium clip to double ligate that. Identify the vagus nerve, protect that and then uh, you get to the carotid after that. Mobilize the carotid, typically debakey, and then I like the coolie scissors to kind of spread and snip to really kind of mobilize the carotid. You want to get almost down into the chest um, with your dissection. As you go down on the carotid, you're pulling up, pulling the carotid up into your incision. This gives you a little bit of additional length to work with. And once you get it free, uh, circumferentially pass a wet umbilical tape in the hemostat and then lay that over the wheat lander in the kind of, uh, into the crotch of the wheat lander. Mark the carotid with marking pen and then the purse string with a 50C1. I think it's a good needle for that uh, kind of a small hole. Gives you a nice, nice good bite. You don't want a necessarily a full thickness bite uh, of the carotid, but make a nice purse string and snip one needle off, leave another lead needle on. And then I, we typically put that into a, a wet lap, fold it up and place that uh, on the side of the neck so it doesn't get tangled up in anything. Then we preferentially use the Profunda clamp. We find that slides in nicely and is a low profile and keep, keeps everything else kind of out of the way. 
So this is the perfect setup. The two springs you see there, the wet umbilical tape that's on a little bit of tension in the crotch of the wheat lander on a hemostat. That helps to bring the carotid up into the operative field and give you a nice working angle as you're going as you're going to place your wires and your stents. The profunda clamp's already in place up underneath, um, ready to go, and you're at this point you've got a really nice working field. Uh, micropuncture to access the common, and Dr. Grimsley really emphasized we're typically on the uh, left-hand side of the patient, but holding with your right hand overhand to the wire right where the wire changes from gray to black. That makes sure that he doesn't have to look up when he's coming to grab the wire. He, does, he knows exactly where you're holding it, and you just slide it in, and that makes sure you don't have to look under floor. You know exactly that 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 wire is going to go in it's about, I think, about a centimeter and a half or two centimeters outside of the, the tip of the needle. It's not going to go across the lesion. You don't, it's a, something that you don't even have to think about. He just, he just grabs it and slides it in. Uh, once the wire is in, he'll usually use the Bakey forceps or his special, a special titanium forcep um, uh, to hold that wire as he pulls the needle removed and then put our four French sheath in, um, taking out the dilator and wire. And then shoot just our scout angiogram, ensure there are no bubbles in the contrast. And that kind of gives us a roadmap of what's going on. And it gives us our line to not cross when we come in with our J wire. And you'll have the rep in the, typically have the rep in the room and they'll go in and uh, they'll mark that on the screen for you. The J wire through the four French under fluoro. And then, you know, they've marked the line where you have your J wire and you don't, you don't go past that line as, you're, as uh, the operating surgeon's passing the four French catheter and, and exchanging for the eight French sheath. But once you have the sheath in, we secure it with a with a three of silk to the chest, so so that that is it is not moving, it is not coming out, and we don't don't even have to think about that. Then the next angio that you do will be your working angiogram. I don't know if uh, if you have the ability to do the mask where it shows you kind of a a white roadmap, but that's a really nice feature that our rad techs are, are getting better at doing on every case, but it's a nice feature to have when you're running your uh, micro wire up. Uh, hook up the flow reversal system and then drape that. We put a wet blue towel over that so that that doesn't slide off of the table. <laughs> then we do our T-car timeout. I'm sure our ACT is greater than 280, our systolic's around 180, uh, that we have everything in the room that we're going to need. Uh, stents, uh, balloon, or a comfy catheter if we need it, that we have absolutely everything. We're at Rad Tech there, we're, we're ready to go. We check the flow reversal, and then uh, once we've done our T-card timeout, we do uh, we clamp the, seat, the, the common, making sure that you look at that, you know, suction down the hole, making sure that those the tip of your profunda clamp are not across the, the vagus nerve or anything like that. Uh, stent deployment, get the, there's, we put a small, small bend to the 014 guide wire just to give you a little maneuverability once you get in there. And then you crawl across the lesion under flow reversal and then pre-dilate depending on what, what your preferences are with a four or five millimeter balloon. Use the Vitrac um, rapid exchange, select the stent, then go into, we'll have the, the rep mark the inferior aspect of the, um, of our kind of landing zone and that will be what we're looking what i'm looking at as i'm deploying that stent i'm I want the bottom of that stent to be right at that mark don't look at the top just just focus on the bottom angiogram uh, after that and plus minus post uh, dilation then we let the flow reversal run for about a minute unclamp the carotid note that time because that's uh, uh, one of the points that they like to document and then disconnect the flow reversal circuit and the, I think another nice technical aspect is the slip knot on the 5 proline. So that if you're doing this by yourself or with somebody who's not, you, know, you don't really trust if you're doing it with a scrub deck or something, that you're in control. So you do two throws the same way, scorch your hands, and then you can pull up on the, so it'll be the string with the needle on for this one. You can just pull up uh, on that string and pull the sheath out, and then you just cinch up that slip knot. And hopefully you have hemostasis most of the time you do. Uh, but if not, you get that other needle on there. You can just bang another stitch in and get hemostasis. For the venous line, we like to use a 3O proline on an MH to get a really big deep bite back, do a U-stitch around that. And the same same concept with the, stip, with the slip knot to get hemostasis there. Make sure there's no more bleeding. 3O model 
Tisma uh, in the skin uh, for a monocryl and then derm bond. We admit our patients to telemetry and then we'll always put an ice pack on their neck as tolerated. Okay, that's uh, my 10 steps. And right, let's go back to the beginning. I think we've really tried to transition to the endo suite, um, but it is, you know, I think we had it down pretty good with the C arm and the OR. What, what do you guys, do you guys usually use endo suite for this? For our, our first year, we're using C arm um, and BHVH. Second year, in Plano, we've been using. Uh, our specialized room and it almost seemed easier doing the C arm because you're able to move around the C arm the way you want to faster than trying to man the bed in time. So we got a better imaging too. Like I said, we have the rad tech. We put the control console that they have that. So we're not even, you know, most of the times we're, we're not messing with that uh, and just having them run it. In the new hybrid room too, they can save the bed settings. So, you know, you, you shoot your scout that you like and they save the bed settings and then you know you can move your c-arm back and then they hit the button and it redoes the those same settings so that's been helpful anything any thoughts on on iaband do you guys usually use iaband that's kind of I think it's attending dependent for us same yeah often we use like little strips just to lock down the drapes but not necessarily a full iaband also attending dependent um, we do our venous line a little bit different than you guys we often don't heparinize during the skin incision, we usually heparinize uh, as we're getting down to the carotid. Okay. And uh, one that usually, you know, you get the carotid out relatively quickly after that, and it, you've got five minutes while your ACT cooks, and then we do our venous line during that time. I apologize uh, the, the beginning. Do you use general anesthesia, or how do you sedate these patients? Yeah, we're, we're usually using general. I don't remember a case that we've done under local. Um, do you have any for neuromonitoring in that setting, or...? We just did the cerebral pulse oximeter, but I don't necessarily know that we would change anything or stop the operation if, if we had you know abnormal readings. And I don't know what the data would be on that, or if there's any anything that uh, any, has any guidelines on, okay, if you get this reading, should you do this? What, what about you guys? We do 50-50 per campus. We do most of them at Cornell a week with, with the either regional block or local anesthesia maybe some light Mac and no neuromonitoring. And at Columbia, they do them almost exclusively under general with EEG monitoring. I can tell you the one time that we've had major signal changes on EEG, we did terminate the operation and we've often wondered whether or not that was indicated. Brad, what do you think about that? I really think the key thing uh, is to do it, to do the case efficiently and quickly. I don't really care about the monitoring. When we cross clamp, we check flow. And typically there's flow, there's been flow pretty much on every single case. Um, looking at about 200 cases now, you know, we haven't had any problems as far as, you know, just expeditiously carrying out the case with no monitoring. Now we do, we, I don't know, Chris hasn't had any experience with the local. He needs to have some experience with local because we've done probably, I'd say 10% of our cases that way. And sometimes you get asked to see a patient who's critically ill or, you know, got a bad heart, whatnot. We've done a couple of cases actually pre-cabbage that way under local anesthesia, both at Baylor and at other facilities. When you do a local, do you do, you do local or you do a cervical block? No, I just use local. Use local and, and once you get down into where the patient, it's easy to take care of the skin with just local, but once you get down around the carotid, if you'll just put lidocaine down in there and let it fester, just a few minutes, it'll numb up everything so that you can use your scissor dissection around the carotid. Once I get past the, what I consider to be the muscle layer and push the uh, IJ out of the way, get down into that, that area in the carotid sheath, I just drop some lidocaine down in there and just let it kind of percolate through the tissues and it kind of numbs up everything. And then I suction it out and then proceed with the uh, scissor dissection. I wanted to know what y'all's retractor setup is. I'm sure it's probably a little attending dependent, but what do you what do you guys like to do for for the retractor setup for skin and for any wheat lander or something like that? Most of these we use two wheat landers or uh, during the dissection, and then and then switch to one almost identical to what you have. Okay, attending that likes to use those little rubber banded hooks like like the colorectal surgeons use. Actually, it actually works out really well. Yeah. Oh, the one, the little hooks where you just, they're, they're on a silastic string and you just clamp. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. But we use it for the most part. Our, our uh, exposure is pretty similar to yours. We don't use the little spring hooks. We just use a second wheat lander. Okay. 
As far as the dissection down by the, do you all, what, what do you guys like to dissect? Is it a coolie scissor, a, a, a mats, or what do you, what do you all? I don't, I'm not familiar with what a coolie scissors are, but we used to just use mats and bombs. Okay. A coolie is just kind of a bigger, bigger, it feels sharper. Dr. Wright always tells us it's, it cuts sharper than a mats. Mats has a softer, I don't know if it's a softer blade on it or something, but, but the coolie is kind of a larger, uh, larger scissor. But it's not, I think it's nice. There's a nice well, spread. Some bombs have a more rounded tip on them than the Kool-Aid. The Kool-Aids are a little more sharper on the hands. But they're not think, pointed. They're just a little sharper. Think of medicine bombs as kind of safety scissors because they, they, you can cut up closer to things. The Kool-Aids are so sharp that you have to be more precise in what you're doing, I think up cutting things with a coolie whereas the metzes are just a little lighter it's very institution dependent i think we're most of the guys here tend to be coolies coolie guys and i was trained with people that were sort of metzen bomb people but it's one of those differentiators i think and you guys are you all using umbilical tape or do you all use a, a vessel loop how are y'all i'm um, going around the, the common i usually use umbilical tape if it's a deep carotid if it's a pretty superficial carotid then we'll Sometimes use a just a regular vessel loop. Okay. So attending dependent. Okay. And then for the purse string, what do you what do you all uh, what do you all like to use? I wish I could tell you the needle we use, but I, it's probably similar. Dr. Schneider. Yeah, guys, thanks for having us. I use a five O proline, and and that needle is fine. Do you know what a, a rep brought up with me the other day is that they actually don't recommend a purse string. The T car company they recommend a U stitch though none of us do that. Have you guys heard that or done that? Yes, I've heard that. Uh, I'll have a comment on that. I think at the national sales meeting, we had one of the ladies there that was talking about, oh, if you use a purse string suture, you're going to narrow the vessel. And we use a purse string suture on every single one of our cases. The key to using a purse string suture is when you make uh, the little mark on top of the vessel, to stay right on the edge of the mark. I don't know if you saw that picture that Chris had a while ago, but as long as you stay right on the edge of the mark and not try to go out away from the edge of the mark, if you, even if you've got a smaller vessel, I'm talking maybe five or four millimeter vessel, which, you know, that's kind of marginal. If you stay right on the edge of that mark, it will not narrow the vessel. We haven't had any carotid duplex follow-up uh, patients with narrowing at the access site so far. And so I, I think that's probably why you heard that. The Z stitch, because some people are concerned that that may narrow the vessel at that point, but we just haven't seen that. Is it full thickness? It's not a full thickness, no. As a matter of fact, if you do enough of these and work on enough carotids, you know that everybody has a different thickness to their carotid. And when you're putting your sutures in, you can assess kind of how difficult it is going to be to place your eight French sheath. That eight French sheath that comes with this set is a little bit blunt on the end. And you can kind of, when you're putting your stitches in, you kind of assess how, how thick wall this vessel is going to be, how woody it's going to be, and how, how difficult it's going to be by just placing your stitches. If you put a stitch in and you all of a sudden you get a intramural, you know, hematoma developing, then you can kind of, your second stitch, as you put it across, you can, you can kind of gauge, gauge it a little, little bit more superficial so that you don't penetrate into the inside the vessel. I think, I think that's a good time to kind of assess things and see how thick the vessel wall is going to be so you can have a better idea. But again, the reason I put the dot on there is because sometimes when, you, when people are doing a stitch, especially in the training part process, it's not uncommon to get an intramural hematoma and you can't really see the center of the purse string. So I think it's very valuable to put that, that little uh, mark on the vessel before you even do the first stitch. And then as far as the clamp, do y'all, do y'all like the Profunda clamp or small angle DeBakey or what, what's y'all's choice for that? It just depends on the, the depth of the carotid, but a lot, of, a lot of time we use the Profunda too. It seems to work really well. Back to your last comment about before putting the eight French sheath, it can be a little hard to get in there. Correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Schneider, but you a lot of times will pre-dilate that with a, with a six French dilator just to make the eight French go in a little smoother. Seems to uh, Correct. Especially if it's uh, deep, 
and uh, and it's going to be a challenge with the angle. In addition, I agree that it can be uh, sometimes difficult to, to introduce that arterial sheath. So sometimes we'll, once we have our AMPLAS wire in place, we'll just quickly pass a little dilator tip, uh, six French uh, dilator into the uh, vessel first and to facilitate introduction of the arterial sheath. Any comments on any of these points? Oh, just one thing. You mentioned earlier that you use a Compi catheter. Do you do anything to that? Or uh, you... that that'll be that'll be if it's if it's a you know angulated or a tight lesion where we you know we got put a little angle on the O one four wire, probably just about that much or so. But yeah, if we're having anything where we're going to need something, we think it, look at it and see. Okay, we may need a little steerability. <clears throat> then we'll use that use that Compi. And what what length Compi catheter do you use? It's a 45 cent. Yeah. It's a short catheter, 40. Yeah, we've one of the attendings uptown has the, the techs always pre-cut a Compi catheter to 30 centimeters just to make it easy to to work with. Yeah. Reload it on the back just in case. Cook makes a bright tip Compi catheter. It comes in a silver package. It's about 40, 40 centimeters long. It's, it's perfect for this case. It's good to know. I'm not sure how y'all's reps do it, but I think that mark that they put on the screen when you get your J-wire just to make sure that it's not it's not going up and down. That's uh, Do y'all do that as well? We use an overlay system, I think, which you, I think you call it the map or the mask. Okay. One of our attendees, Dr. Chu, kind of uh, introduced us to the, the, the 3-0 silk stitch on the skin, basically right, you know, right in between the wheat lander where your... Uh, sheath's going to come out and that's been that's been a really nice kind of stabilization stitch for the sheath and make sure that does that's not moving in and out not causing any injuries so we were i think that's been a nice nice little addition uh, for us well that's a standard addition that's something that the company teaches right from day one is to always have a stitch in there to secure your sheath i think the chew stitch is what we call we we, pre, we put it in ahead of time before anything else happens. Like in that picture you just had, you go ahead and put a stitch across there, lay your silk across from one side to the other so that when you do access the vessel, you can just go ahead and tie your stitch around the sheath. That's where the chew stitch comes in. Let's see. And I think I forgot to mention that we typically do maybe a little, uh, little rotation towards, so if it's a left side lesion, then towards the right side or vice versa. And then I think putting that wet blue towel across the, when you have the flow reversal system, make sure that that thing's kind of heavy, make sure it doesn't flop either one way or the other. Just kind of secure that down is also a nice little tip. Chris, I want to mention something right quick. Some of the guys were talking about, you know, they work in uh, C-arm and C-arm works really great and everything. And it does. And uh, if you have the privilege of working in an endo suite, some people have complained about the II being so big to work up under the edge of it. You know, it's kind of hard to see what you're doing, that kind of thing. A couple of things there. Um, I th first of all, I think the operating surgeon or even both of the, the assistant can even have a headlight. A headlight works really well down a deep hole uh, in the dark while you're working with C-arm or in the endo suite. So I always wear a headlight. I think that's very important on this case. The other thing is when you're setting, before you get started, where you put, you've done your exposure, that kind of thing, is to have some built-in RAO or LAO by rotating your table one way or another. Um, I always stand on the right side. I think the surgeon, the operating surgeon, should probably stand on the right side of the table at all times, whether you're working on the left or right. And if you're working on the left, you just build in a little LAO by rotating the table toward you. And that way, if you swing the C-arm or the, the endo suite arm over to the left, you, you have an exaggerated LAO there. You can see up under the edge of it. And the same thing goes with the other side. So you can work the table to have some built-in LAO and RAO before you even uh, swing the C-arm either way. For the T-card timeout, I think this is kind of a, you know, getting everybody refocusing on what's going on, get anesthesia off of their phone and <laughs> focus on what, what's going on and really being like, okay, here, here, are, do we have everything that we need? Are we where we want to be with the blood pressure and uh, check and flow reversal one more time and then, and then clamping. Any comments on that from anybody? Is that kind of standard what you guys are doing as well? 
Yeah, seems about right. Because you were doing it under local, and you and you you test clamp, or do you turn this gizmo on and see what happens, or how do you assess it when you're in a local with local anesthetic? When you're under local, I mean, you can determine if the patient's going to tolerate flow reversal. Almost everybody does. It's rare that they don't. But if they don't, so you do clamp. If they have any intolerance, then you can unclamp, ask the anesthesiologist to uh, uh, increase the blood pressure. And oftentimes, with kind of that preconditioning step and raising the blood pressure, when you reclamp again, the patients will tolerate it. So it's happened uncommonly. I'd say that it's probably less than 5% of the time, but, but being under local does allow you to judge that, that flow reversal intolerance and then to act on it. Change the f- flow rate, the flow switch on the... Uh... You can go to low flow, and then if you have a patient who's truly not going to tolerate flow reversal at all, then you can convert to where you can use distal uh, protection with a, with a filter and still do the procedure if you needed to, but I, I haven't had to convert the not using flow reversal, uh, raising the blood pressure and, you know, giving the patient a few minutes and then reclamping has allowed us uh, to be able to do it in every case so far. Do you think people tolerate flow reversal better than they tolerate just clamping a carotid artery? More people seem to have neurologic symptoms with doing a carotid endarterectomy under local than with a T-car I'm not exactly sure. I mean, I think that certainly it's a shorter amount of time that the carotid's going to be clamped uh, compared to a carotid endarterectomy. The clamp times are going to be way shorter, so maybe that's that's part of it. And you know, I'm I'm a selective shunter anyhow with uh, carotid endarterectomies, and it turns out that I usually shunt less than 10% of my cases too. So I'm not sure it's all that dramatically different, and it probably also depends on what mode of neuromonitoring that you're you're using. How how sensitive or oversensitive it may be. Are they still teaching in the in the course to uh, change the flow to low flow? Yeah, they are. And we've talked about that, you and I, just trying to figure out. We, we really don't. I've had one case where it actually going to low flow, increasing the blood pressure. The guy was hyperkinetic. Started getting hyperkinetic under local anesthesia. You could tell he was moving around and not tolerating it. And so I, I unclamped, restored flow, settled him down, got the blood pressure up. We went to low flow on the system, reclamped again. I'm not sure whether the low flow helped or just getting his blood pressure to 200 so we can have three minutes of time <laughs> to be able to put the carotid stent in. And in this particular case, I'm thinking about. That's the key. I believe Dr. Snyder said that, you know, it's just a, just need a few minutes to get that stent up. You can even get your balloon preloaded, ready to traverse the lesion as soon as the wire goes up. So we usually put the wire in place at, in, at the bottom of the screen and have the balloon ready to go there as well. It's particularly if it looks like one you're going to be able to get across rather easily. Yeah, no, that's a good point. So I, before we actually clamp and go, we have everything prepped and ready on the table. And I actually put the pre-dilatation balloon into the sheet. So it's right up just close to the sheet tip with the wire preloaded. So as soon as we clamp, then you immediately advance the wire across the lesion. Your balloon's already mounted and pre-dil and, and then stent and, and then hopefully you're, you're done. So in a patient who is is you're having issues who had some uh, intolerance of the flow reversal initially you can do this case pretty quickly uh, uh as long as the anatomy is not too challenging and you have everything all set all right fantastic well let's see i think we kind of discussed some of this stuff a uh, little bend to the to the wire to get across the lesion and then any any comments here um as far as any technical, technical steps that we need to look at and avoiding misadventures? Well, I'll say one thing is you can usually look at a lesion and tell whether it's going to be a challenge to get across it. And that's where the comfy catheter comes in pretty handy. Instead of putting the balloon up, I'll have the comfy catheter ready to go. It, especially it looks like it's very tortuous or a very tight lesion. You may need a little extra help getting across. And sometimes, it's happened a couple of times, we see a preoperative study that looks, you know, like it's going to be a tight lesion. You get in there, you, you've had a case or two where it looks, looks like it's occluded, 
Uh, you get just some reconstitution distal. You get up there with your cumpy. You cross the lesion. You push your cumpy up to do a little test shot to make sure you hadn't dissected the vessel. And then go ahead and advance your wire on up, pull your cumpy out, put your balloon in, pre-dilate it, put your stent in. Go that step and that sequence, um, especially if it looks like it's occluded. So I, I, we've done that a couple of times. Once you get in there, sometimes you just have to go ahead and do it once you're there. And I think the company comes in real handy in that particular situation. I, I think that that's a good suggestion. I think it really depends on a case-by-case -case basis on the anatomy. Some are pretty straightforward, put a little bend on the wire. I don't use their wire. I use, you can use any 014 wire. I use the wires that I like to use uh, normally. And I think you should use what you're familiar with. And I agree, it depends on the anatomy. Maybe a slight bend, maybe a little bit more bend on the wire. And if you think there's a really sharp angle and it's gonna be really challenging, it's really tight, then, then you could be prepared with a, with a short Compi or Berenstein catheter uh, to, to help make that turn and, and introduce the wire. What wire do you use, Darren? I, I usually just use a Grand Slam wire for this, but I think that you can use you know, whatever wire. I like the Grand Slam because we've used it a lot for a lot of different things. I think the tip is easy to shape on the back table and, you know, it's, it's torqueable. It has about the right amount of support for doing the case. So that's just the one that I've used, but I'm sure that there are multiple wires that you can use, but you should use what you're familiar with and what, what you think is in your mind when you look at a lesion would be the best wire to use. Chris, I don't remember if you said this, but we also, after crossing the lesion, we also always get two views, basically, just to make absolute certain we're in the right space and then drive the wire up to the skull base and watch it take that first turn, address portion. Thank you so much for mentioning that. I, I did not. Do y'all rotate, y'all rotate the, the C-arm, just like a little LAO or RAO to get a second view? Ideally, you do your cross view the, that's, you know, 60 to 90 degrees off of your ideal view and shoot that one and then you can go back to what your ideal view opening up the internal and external to the maximum point and then take that view uh, and then you're in place to to finish your operation and then we do the exact same two view thing at the end the key thing for us is that now you always want to see that that wire that if you you maybe mag out and make sure the wire tricks that that turn through the petrous portion of the skull base of the carotid, the wire tip, and then you know that you're in the carotid and not uh, artery or branch of the external. I think this. I think that's a very good point. That probably is not emphasized enough. Um, exactly what you were talking about. Just double, triple checking because that can be the worst. I mean, what if you stent the external carotid? I mean, or one of the branches of the. You know, it's just you got to be sure you're in the internal. Absolutely. Has that been reported? Oh yeah. External standing, yeah. It's easy to do, and it's easy to prevent. And at a time when you're trying to teach simplicity, as you're trying to walk people through this procedure and, and really make it kind of simple, that's one of those simple things that can really make this case go terribly bad. So, What are the other worst-case scenarios here? Well, dissection. Dissection is probably the one thing that people – talk about the most, access dissection. Yeah, so one thing that, that we do that wasn't mentioned here, I mean, I, I know you said that there's the mark on the initial 018 wire when you do the access and that you don't need to watch under fluoro. We watch every wire passage under fluoro because you just want to see that that wire is behaving uh, appropriately and that you're not dissecting the common carotid. And so we just watch everything uh, we do. On the micropuncture technique, you watch the wire in that part as well. Yeah, so I have the fluoro in there, and so we'll 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 stick, uh, get the needle in, move the fluoro in uh, quickly, and then uh, we we've got the mark on the wire. But I just want to see that that wire tip comes out freely, that you're not in a little dissection plane with the needle, that you're in the back wall of the vessel or something like that. And uh, I think it's uncommon, but certainly if you dissect the common, then that that's going to make this case uh, uh, a big problem. Absolutely. And sometimes that's necessary. If it doesn't feel right, tell, tell the residents and fellows, if it doesn't feel right, don't advance. And one of the things while we're talking about the access wire, Chris made a big point about the assistant holding the wire and then the two hands mating together on the wire so that, and, and not the operator who's advancing the wire should not do the technique of doing this number here. 
to advance the wire in because it's just not easy to see in a room sometimes when it's dark of where that point on the wire is. And I think you mentioned it goes in one to two centimeters, but it's actually, if you go to that mark, it's about a three centimeter out the end of your needle into the vessel. So that's, that's always something that when you're teaching, that's an important point to make. All right. And then anything on closing and post-operatively? I, mean, I, don't, I think this is all pretty, pretty straightforward stuff. What about full reversal? The, uh, who, how do you guys do the reversal um, for the hair? We, we, we do full reversal. Um, just because I've had a couple cases where everything is perfect, patient's great, and they go neck hematoma just because you haven't reversed the, the heparin. And, and it's usually not a big deal, but it can be, you know, pain. And they have this big golf ball on their neck that they complain about. Um, and occasionally I've had to deal with it. So that's really gone away since we reversed the uh, heparin. I think there's been a study that's been done showing that there's, uh, you know, really no significant risk of reversing the heparin at the end of the case. So, you know, patients are already usually on a dual antiplatelet therapy and and so they should be protected. So we reverse in every case. Chris, what about us? What do we do? I think we usually do about half reversal. You see a 40, you know, 40 a protamine or something, 30, 40, depending on their weight. And yeah, we, we do have some post-op hematomas, but we'll do, we usually do an ice pack uh, on the patients. And once they get, once they land in the recovery room um, and you know, just kind of accept maybe a little bit of oozing. What's the ice pack for? Just to reduce inflammation. When you say half reversal, you mean reverse half of patients or you're giving a half dose protamine? Half, half dose protamine. Okay. How much are you giving? 40 sounds like a lot. Yeah, that's about what we give, like 30. Yeah, we probably do about the same. And then we usually check the ACT and make sure that it's, it's back in a normal range. No, I mean, Chris is right, though. If you're, giving a, if you're shooting for an ACT of 280, you know, the, then, then 30 to 40 protamine is not your traditional cardiac quote unquote dose of protamine. They'd be given 60 to 80. Well, typically we'll, we'll shoot for an ACT around 300 and yeah. almost every time we're given 30 of protamine at the end of the case. Yeah. And I, I tell people that putting a drain in is not a failure in this particular case. After all, you know, some people have a different dissection than others. Some people have a lot of soft tissue to dissect through you got the patient on aspirin and Plavix. You've just given them heparin. You don't want to fully reverse them at the end of the case. So to me, I mean, it's, a drain is pretty unusual to have to put, but dropping a little drain in there and bringing it out a separate incision is not necessarily a failure. And we do that occasionally, but that's, that's the way I look at that. I, I usually don't like – when I was doing transfemoral carotid stenting, I never I, – I think I can safely say I never – uh, gave uh, any protamine reversal out of fear of what's the worst thing that can happen here after a successful case is you thrombose the stent, which has happened some, to some of my colleagues. And so I, I kind of adopted a philosophy of never giving protamine at the end of a transdermal carotid stenting. So this case with a little open component to it, I give a little protamine, but I, I certainly don't give a full dose reversal because usually these cases last only about 30 to 40 minutes. So just give us what I use to give us about 30. Yeah. I, I think we do the same thing. I, I when I do transfemoral carotid stenting, I don't reverse, but I think it's different when you have an incision in the neck. What is the uh, venous line suture? What are you suturing? So it's basically preventing sort of post operative oozing. So it's just basically you know, where the where the needles or where the you know, sheaths coming out of the skin go beyond that, come back around it with a U stitch and then go up and that just kind of gives you local hemostasis and we just so somebody doesn't have to sit there and hold pressure and it's just it really has worked nicely to to prevent any sort of you know access site hematomas we take it out on post-op day one before they go home it's a horizontal mattress mh stitch yeah so it's, it's pretty large and it's deep try to get it down near the vein and just do a horizontal mattress okay and it's another good way to teach to the fellows and residents that they don't know how to do a slip knot to do a slip knot. That's a good, good, good opportunity to learn how to do it. Believe it or not, it, it does happen occasionally. People come through and don't know how to do a slip knot properly. All right. Well, any, any other comments or questions? Send them home the same day or the next day? Next day. They, they stay overnight. Telemetry or ICU or just any place in the hospital? It's a uh, step down uh, 
and it's a telemetry ward, not ICU, uh, and we observed them uh, overnight. I think that the, the you know, the, the complications post stenting usually oftentimes are a few hours delayed if you're going to get a stent thrombosis or a problem like that. And most complications will be manifest within 12 hours. So I think if you watch them overnight, then you're safe to send them home. And what do you guys do for blood pressure management post op? Good question. So we'll typically try and keep them, you know, systolic less than 140 and above 100. So we use cardine for greater than 140 and then give them some fluid or something. If they're, if we have big kind of issues with it, we, for, with hypotension, we'll use something like vasopressin. Um, but fairly uncommon, but we have had a couple of cases in my, you know, uh, in my first year of training that, that we've needed to do something for and had, I don't know if, I can't remember if it was a regular carotid or a, a T car that had to, you know, sometimes you'll have these people that are super hypertensive and requiring you know, multiple drips. that will be in the hospital for a couple of days. Typically hypotension is something we see more, more commonly. That's been something and sending the patient home on Sudafed or if we see a, a tendency to start or be hypotensive initially, I just send them home on Sudafed. But typically it, you'll see that person in recovery and how they're acting and we've had we've had patients it seemed like with the transfemoral groups too you know stenting has always been a hypotension is more of a problem yeah that was actually going to be my exact question i had heard of people doing that but we we don't do it and i wanted to see if you had any experience with the sudafed yeah we've got quite a bit of experience with it actually and it works it works, seems to work great I've seen that especially with uh, the really tight lesions and, and I think it's been a lot of the bradycardia. We've been seeing you know, heart rates in the 30s. They're normally asymptomatic and they, they look fine, but you know I think that stent in a really tight uh, bifurcation can lead to some bradycardia. Do you guys stop basoplegic agents on day of procedure? Lysinopril, uh, the ARBs, are you, are you guys stopping those on day of procedure? We usually stop, uh, except for beta blockers. Yeah, everything except for beta blockers or you know alpha blockers, we stop. We get some patients with this, you know kind of post procedure headache. Is, is there anything that you guys will sometimes do a medrol dose pack or something like that? Is there anything that you guys have found that works particularly well for you know kind of reperfusion headache? I don't think that we've done anything specific to mitigate against that. Certainly, you know, it's, I think it's careful blood pressure control. If you have a patient with a headache who had a really tight lesion or bilateral disease, then I think you've got to, you know, uh, be vigilant that they're not going to get it through hyperperfusion syndrome. I think those patients you may have to watch uh, if, it's, if it's not dissipating. <laughs> yeah. You know, certainly don't want to dis discharge somebody who's describing a significant headache. Yeah. Is there any indication for carotid endarterectomy in this era? Yeah, I mean, I still do a fair amount of endarterectomy. Uh, it's a good operation. There certainly are patients that are going to be excluded based on anatomy for TCAR if you've got common carotid disease or an inadequate uh, clavicle of bifurcation distance or uh, you know, if the vessel's really deep or something in the base of the neck. You know, that there still is definitely a role for uh, endarterectomy. It's a good operation, works well. I still sometimes get a little scared with the really bad symptomatic lesions that are embolizing type lesions or I believe that sometimes I in a good risk patient would, would still possibly prefer endarterectomy for those patients. Well calcification is definitely on well, circumferential calcification I think it's probably an obvious thing, but that's 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 the one to speak to your point, Dr. I is not a good time to do a stent. Yeah, I totally agree, and I forgot to mention that. But but we get CTAs preoperatively on these patients, and if there's a you know a big eccentric bulky calcified lesion or circumferential calcification, those patients are are going to do better with an NRF, we prefer. Chris, thanks for putting together that presentation. Thanks for uh, letting us join. That was that was really useful. No, that, I think it was that was a lot of fun. I think it got some good angles on it from a bunch of different people. So thank you guys for for taking the time. Yeah, thank you for having us. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.